Welcome, Morphites, to another episode of the Bible Versus series. I'm your host, Sam, and uh, this is another regular content we put up here on the Morphite channel, and we're looking to do these once a week, so tune in, subscribe, all that stuff, so you can catch up with us as we do these every week. Uh, the Bible Versus series, we're going to be breaking down specific biblical uh, verses against cultural items. So, for example, today we're talking about Bindi Irwin and this idea of the green Mother Earth and all of those things. And uh, so within this series, we're going to be taking real world, real things that are happening now and then taking the Bible and contrasting them to see, do they align with scriptural principles? And if so, how? And if not, how not? So anyways, we're going to jump right into this one. This is actually a video I'll be reviewing on here and we'll be uh, pausing it as we go throughout. Uh, I will post the link to the YouTube version of the video if you want to watch it on your own without my commentary. Uh, however, I cannot guarantee that it will stay live. Uh, so what I may end up doing is uh, posting the version that I have downloaded as an unlisted video uh, with a link so that you can go watch it. It's not necessarily something I want to promote, but uh, if you want to be able to access the original source video, I can make that available. All right, so let's hop right in here and make sure I got my verses in the right place here. We're actually starting back in Genesis, as things so often do. This is chapter two. All right, and let me pull up the video here. As I mentioned, the video is uh, from a young, well, was a young lady. <laughs> the video is actually from a few years ago. Bindi Irwin is her name, and you may recognize the last name. Her father was Steve Irwin, the uh, crocodile hunter. And you've probably seen him on television before. Very, very popular, very famous character. And she, of course, carries on the tradition and the teaching that he gave her and the rest of the family to do with conservation and wildlife and those sort of things. However, this video in particular struck my interest because as I started watching it, I quickly realized that this is the epitome. This, this, is, this is a the combination of several different thoughts and principles that are at work in the world today to do with the Green New Deal, to do with the Mother Earth, to do with conservation, all of those things, they're all tied together, and we'll see how and why and how it uh, contradicts scripture. So, all right, we'll jump right in here. We'll start at the beginning, and I'll be pausing as we go throughout. I have chosen to devote my life to being a wildlife warrior, speaking for those who cannot speak for themselves. Being a wildlife warrior means to dedicate your life to making the world a better place for future generations. Often, when people hear the word conservation, they think of little woodland creatures. Actually, conservation is ultimately about us people. All right, so she starts off talking about this idea of being a wildlife warrior. It's something that, you know, obviously a branding deal, basically, that they made up uh, in order to get everyone on board with the things that they are all about. Uh, I, I immediately was thinking, of course, of Genesis, because obviously you see the green in the video. You see, you know, she's talking about wildlife and humanity and our relationships there. That all started in Genesis. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse number 15. And we'll go through verse 17, Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. From the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So we see from the very beginning that God gave man a responsibility to take care of the place that he had made, this creation, the, specifically the garden that he placed him in. But uh, there's scripture and principle all throughout where we're supposed to be taking care of the earth upon which we are placed. We have dominion over the earth. We're supposed to be taking care of it. He assigned us this task. So in a sense, uh, this idea from a lot of conservationists that, hey, we should take care of the earth. We shouldn't be trashing it. We should be maintaining it and making sure it doesn't fall apart is a biblical principle. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians, because of the whole tree hugger aspect, of a lot of conservationist movements have pushed back against it and have basically gone the other way of like, well, it doesn't really matter or we don't need to care about the environment. And biblically, we are. That In fact, that was one of our very first mandates from God was take care of this planet. I gave it to you to be your its steward. As humankind, we are the stewards of the earth. Uh, let's go back a little bit actually to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26, and we'll go through verse 31. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So we see there, uh, God made us, and we're supposed to be in charge of all of these animals. They are our, uh, they're our job, basically, that we were given from God, very first job we were given from God. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created he him, male and female created he them. We've talked about that, of course, in 
our in some of our previous episodes. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So we see these things connected between uh, making man in our image, and then having dominion, and then uh, God creating in man in his image, creating man, male and female, and then man being fruitful and multiplying, replenishing, subduing, having dominion. These things are all tied together in the scripture. And so that's a very important thing to get in your mind from the get-go is that at the very beginning, the first chapter of the Bible, God assigned these things and has them all connected in tandem. Being fruitful, multiplying, replenishing the earth, subduing it, having dominion over it, and over all of the creatures that inhabit the earth as well. And these are all part of the very beginning of why God's telling man why he made him and what he made him to do and what he's supposed to be doing with his time and with his life. All right. Uh, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree and which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you. It shall be for meat. So at the very beginning there, he says man is allowed to eat of all of the trees of all of the things in the garden. Although he does put a caveat on that, as we know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the one tree that he says you're not supposed to eat from. To every beast of the earth, to every fowl of the air, to every creeping thing, to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. And this is important because God doesn't call things good unless they actually are good, unless he actually approves of them. So this is very important. Again, all this stuff connects together. Uh, the next verse I wanted to look at was Genesis chapter chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, to verse 19, Oop, chapter 19, chapter 2, verse 19. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found in help meat for him. So God, Adam exercises this authority that God gives him by naming the animals. Naming something is a very powerful thing. Once you name something, it, it has a sense of presence. It has a sense of being. And it's interesting, uh, just as a side note, that God relinquished his own dominion over naming the animals to Adam. And in other words, God could have named all the animals and said, this is the name of this animal, Adam. This is what you shall call it. Because that's what God does with his own name. None of the names of God that we have in the scripture were given by man to God. They were given from God to man. He told us, this is what you shall call me. And this is what it means. And, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But this is an interesting point because it shows how much trust and how much care God has put into his creation. But then he hands that over to man. He says, mankind, Adam, you name them. I want you to take this, this action to be a part of this process of naming the animals as they as they walk by. So it's a really interesting thing and also shows the involvement of these three things of God, man, and the earth. And it's all supposed to be this whole cycle, this whole system that God set up. All right, so that's just all, right off the bat. That really is going to cover a lot of the rest of the video, but I wanted to go ahead and get some of those things out of the way right off the get-go. So let's go, let's watch a little more of, uh, of Bindi here, uh, starting at, uh, let's see, 28 seconds. We'll go for a little further. I believe that most problems in the world today, such as climate, stem from one immense problem, which seems to be the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. This problem is our ever-expanding human population. We're expanding. All right, so <laughs> this is this obviously right off the bat. She's talked about being a wildlife warrior, yada yada. This you know this is good stuff, right? But this right here immediately is where I see this taking a turn away from the scripture. Because what she says here, she puts the blame of all the problems in the world as far as anything ecological, you know, any of those things on this idea of the expanding human population. And that already from the verses we've looked at is a very, is a wrong interpretation of reality the way God created it. All right, so let's, let's look at what man's problems actually come from. <laughs> uh, Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. So here we see that the creature, uh, the creation, you know, the things in creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. In other words, the creation itself is not whole and complete and comfortable because the sons of God have not been manifest totally and properly. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So here we see that the earth itself and all of the ecosystems and everything, they struggle and, they ha and they're not fitted jointly together the way they're supposed to be, the way God intended, because of sin. And 
this is why the, immediately when you take a deviation from basing your philosophy off of scripture, but just off of pure observation, pure science, or purely your own opinion, you immediately can come up with the wrong conclusion. God here tells us in the scripture that the problems with the world, the problems we see today are not because of uh, Mother Earth groaning or suffering from, you know, this kind of a thing from expanding human population but rather because of sin. Sin itself is the problem. It's the reason why there are there is trouble, there is problem in the world today, the sin curse. And we saw, of course, earlier that it also is a problem. The problems are arising because man has not done his duty, has not done his responsibility that God gave to him of taking care of the earth, of doing all of those things in the way that he told man to do it. Uh, and we'll, there's a lot of this stuff that overlaps, so we'll probably be co coming back around to a few of these uh, things again. Let's go ahead on... A little bit further here. Experiencing a six mass extinction right now. Keep in mind that the previous five were caused by things like asteroid impact or volcanic eruption. So she starts talking about mass extinction events and <laughs> compares the explosion in population to a mass extinction event, which is a little scary to me, but uh, from her mindset makes sense. What I wanted to touch on, though, is mass extinction events as they occur in the scripture, because if we are seeing those happening in the world, we need to ask ourselves what, why and where those came from. And let's go back to Genesis again. Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6, and starting in verse 5. And this is, of course, talking about the flood. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 uh, through verse 7, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So God here was talking about how bad it had gotten, how how corrupted mankind had become, and we're already only here a few generations in. Uh, this is Noah, this is still in Genesis, we're only six chapter Genesis, and already God's saying, you know what, these people that I created, I gave them a job, I, I they messed it up from the get-go, they ate of the tree, and now they're already corrupting the earth itself, they're wicked all the time continuously, I should destroy them. And that's what God's talking about. Uh, and we see that that is the first mass extinction event in the scripture, and we see why that happens. Genesis chapter 6, verse 17, a few verses down, says, Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. So this is a mass extinction event uh, to define all mass extinction events, right? He is saying, I will destroy every living thing on the earth. Today, we often see floods, calamities, volcanoes, whatever it may be, earthquakes, and yes, you know, loss of life, and that's a terrible thing, but the scope of a an actual mass extinction event, an actual wiping out of humankind, is we only see in something like the flood, where we see God himself intervening and saying, I am not happy, I will do something about this. And that's when we see that happen. So, of course, we roll that back and we say, well, how can we avoid a mass extinction event? It would be to follow after God, right? Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, Exodus 12, 12. Says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, will smite all firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Here we see the, of course, the Passover event, and we see this uh, pattern pop up again and again of when God wipes out a huge amount of people, it's because they were all disobeying him, uh, they were attacking his people, they were not listening to his commands, and they were not doing things the way that he had told them to do them. So if you want to avoid this judgment, if you want to avoid these, this, these big, you know, swaths of people getting wiped out, this is how you do it: is you follow after. After God, you listen to him. Genesis chapter 13, verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Here we see the Sodomites were doing the wickedness that they were doing all the time. That's all they cared about. They were not following after God whatsoever. Chapter 18, verse starting in verse 20. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is coming to me, and if not, I will know. And obviously he already knew, but he was making this plain of how this was going to play out. <coughs> Uh, let's see, verse 26 talks a little more about that. The Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. So here we see God's mercy, God's grace still at work, even though he's going to rain down literal fire and brimstone from heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And we saw the same thing in the flood, where he gave Noah and his family the opportunity, and everyone else who would join them, really, to, to escape this flood. He said, here's how you're going to do it. You're going to build an ark. You're going to follow my instruction. You're going to follow me. You're going to believe me. And then you will be spared through that uh, obedience, through that faith. So just when we're when we're talking about mass extinction, when we're talking about, oh no, you know, all life is coming to an end, 
we really have to talk about those things in context of God. What is God trying to accomplish? Is God judging mankind? And if so, should how can you individually or we as humanity be looking to God to ask for his grace, to ask for his mercy, and to avoid this destruction? We should be following after his patterns, his precepts, his commands in order to do that. Uh, we're not going to escape judgment by sciencing our way out of it is really the bottom line. So let's go to uh, 58, yeah, we're right there, okay. I once had a friend who lived to be 104 years old. Ruth was a remarkable woman who experienced so much in her lifetime. When she was born, there was no such thing as sliced bread, zippers, or even plastic. Ruth did not see a car until she was 10 years old. However, to me, the most astonishing fact is that when Ruth was born, there were 1.5 billion people on the planet. Ruth died a few years ago at age 104, and today there are over 7 billion people on the planet. In one woman's lifetime, the human population increased by more than 5 billion billion people. These are truly overwhelming figures. All right, so she's talking about uh, her friend Ruth, who was 104 years old, which is pretty impressive. No matter, no matter who you are, that's uh, that's actually pretty great. That's more than uh, the average or the mean by which God said we were able to live. So what's interesting here is that she already has this attitude that having children, populating the earth, or or what, what they would consider overpopulating, having more children and more and more and more, is a bad thing. This, again, is directly contradictory to scriptural principle. Let's go to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, verse number 7. And you, be fruit, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. So this was actually, again, these things are all connected in, in uh, they're near each other and these things are all interworking together. This is spoken to Noah directly after that mass extinction event and he's uh, of the flood and he's telling him, bring forth abundantly in the earth, multiply, have lots of kids, have lots of generations, and and be fruitful. That's what he's telling him to do. And it's a command that he gives to him. Ezekiel chapter 36 is another interesting place. This concept shows up. Ezekiel 36 and verse number 11. That would be the cat coming in there. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse number 11. And I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit, and I will settle you after your old estates, and will do better unto you than at your beginnings, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Here we see, this shows up all throughout the scripture, but I wanted to highlight a few verses here and there, that the idea of blessing and being fruitful and multiplying are go together, go hand in hand. God shows blessing, or it's an illustration, I should say, of God's blessing when you are able to procreate, when you're able to be fruitful and multiply. It is a natural thing that is built into every creature to be able to reproduce, and it's the pattern by which things are to exist and persist, continue existing, and it is also a, a showcase of God's blessing, a showcase how fruitful you are is a showcase of God smiling upon you and giving blessing unto you. He always connects those things together, a blessing and multiplication or fruitfulness are, are, are one and the same in the sense that a blessing, being fruitful and multiplying falls in the category of blessing. Uh, let's go to one more, I think. Oh, Psalm 127. This is the one that most people refer to when they're talking about having kids and, and the bounty of having lots of children. Uh, a Song of Degrees for Solomon. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. So we see God, God's the one who gives you the children. The fruit of the womb is his reward. So when you have children, when you're able to bear fruit, then that is a, sh a sign of God's blessing. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. And here we see there are other blessings that come with having children, having lots of children. As he says, happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. They are arrows that God gives to you to accomplish your goals and your uh, your beliefs upon the earth, God's teachings that he has given to you. And it's so interesting how this is, a lot of people I think have been convinced that having children is a negative thing or it's a it's a hard responsibility that is given to you. It's like, it's a task. Yes, it is hard. Yes, there are lots of responsibilities that come with having children, to feed them, to clothe them, all those things. But what's interesting about having children, having generations specifically, that generational line concept is that is true power upon the earth. That's something that many people have either forgotten or have not realized is that in order for you to, to uh, go out, to disseminate your beliefs, your views, your goals, your purposes throughout the earth, whether it's locally or abroad, 
you're only one person. But you can accomplish that when you multiply yourself, when you literally and figuratively multiply yourself, your beliefs, your views, your teachings, which obviously should come from God and from the scripture. And as you have more children, there's opportunities for you to affect the earth, for you to be able to do good, multiply. And so this is where, this is a, a measure of power that God has given to us of, the, of being able to have children pass on your lineage. They will get inheritance from you, both in teaching or in material goods and in belief. But that then multiplies out, multiplies, multiplies, multiplies. And within one or two generations, one family or one couple could influence a large, vast part of the population because they are following things in the way that God has set them up to be. Uh, so that's just another... Another thing about children there. All right, let's go back to Miss Irwin here. 50, yep. Yeah. I must ask the question, how is it possible that our fragile planet can sustain these masses of people? Think of it this way. Pretend for a moment that I'm having a party, inviting 15 of my closest friends. I've rented a room big enough to fit 15 people. I've bought 15 sandwiches for each one of my friends to eat. And I've put together 15 party bags, one for each friend. My party is about to start, and I hear a knock at the door. My friends are here. Only when I open the door, 70 of my friends are standing there wanting to come to the party. What do I do? My room is only big enough to fit 15. With 70, we won't have any room to move and dance. I don't have enough food. Do I divide the sandwiches among the 70 people? But then everyone will still be hungry. What about the party bags? Do I only give party bags to the closest friends? Isn't that unfair to everyone else? That is the crisis facing mother. All right, I paused it right there on purpose. Uh, can the planet sustain so many people is basically the question and the illustration she brought up about the party and everything. The, my main issue with this, this illustration is that we don't know how, much re how many resources are even on the earth. Like we have not we have not dug everything out so we don't have a, a specific measurement of saying well there's so much of this and there's so many people and these two things don't meet uh, we don't have those numbers really available maybe they could be estimated uh, so any 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 decisions made upon that would again be estimations at best to say oh we should limit the population to this much or or something like that um, I know that's not necessarily a scriptural thing but I just wanted to point that out just logically uh, of kind of the breakdown of that particular argument however if we toss all of that out the window, we ignore logic completely, we still have assurances from God. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. This again was really interesting because this is after the flood. God is, uh, Noah builds an altar, right? Noah built an altar unto the Lord, took of every clean beast, of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. So he says, even though mankind may get really bad again, I will not do this thing in this way. I will not flood the earth. And of course, we saw the rainbow given by the Lord as a promise of that. Genesis 8, 22, though, is what I really want to focus on because this is a promise. This is God saying it, which means it's always true and he will hold to it. While the earth remaineth, in other words, while the earth still exists, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. And this is a great verse to come back to, Genesis 8, 22. When you talk to anyone, if you just want to remember one single verse about uh, climate change, about the ecology, about uh, the earth being overrun, pollution, whatever it is, coming back to this verse. Because he says, while the earth remaineth. In other words, if the Lord has not destroyed the earth itself, seed time and harvest, so being able to sow and reap and get a bounty from the earth, cold and heat, so we see those cycles, right? Summer and winter, cycles of the year, day and night, cycle of both day and night, shall not cease. So he says in that verse specifically, very particularly, these things, these cycles, these ways, these patterns that I have set up for things to operate in will not stop until God himself stops them, until God himself destroys the earth. And as, as we know, if you study into Revelation and all the things to come, that is something that God himself will accomplish. So we have no need to worry about, will I be able to uh, get seed time and harvest? Will, I, will, will it be hot and cold? Will day follow night? Those things are going to persist, are going to keep going because God set them in motion and God has said they will not stop. So that is a very comforting verse to come back to. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, this is an, another uh, little, just a way of thinking when, we, when we're considering these things. Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse number 25. 
This is Christ talking. And he's saying here that if your focus is on all of this stuff, all of the things and, and whether you can eat and all of that stuff, your focus is on the wrong place anyways. Matthew 6, 25, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Isn't God going to feed you when you need it? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto a stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. This is the other uh, interesting thing about the worry that is brought up by these concepts of global warming or, or you know, rainforest burning up or whatever it might be is this idea that there's not really anyone in charge. But in verse Matthew chapter 6, verse 32, he says, Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. God knows what's going on. He sees what's happening. He knows how much you need and how much you don't need. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If that's what you're pursuing, if that's what your focus is on, he'll take care of all that little stuff that we think is so important, that we think is, is going to solve all of our problems in the world. Uh, but the, the needs, the actual things that you need in order to survive, in order to keep serving God, he will provide. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You have enough to worry about in what you need to accomplish today for good and for God. Uh, so those are some great verses too in Matthew chapter 6 from Christ. And just the idea of God being in charge and God being the one who is wise over all. Let's go back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number uh, 10, starting in verse 12. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. This is the same thing Christ was talking about. To keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Your ultimate goal is not... Where does my meal next, next meal come from? Your ultimate goal is not how are we going to feed the poor? Your ultimate goal is not how are we going to take care of the planet? It is, am I going to obey God, follow him, obey his statutes and his commandments? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God. The earth also, with all that therein is. This is God's earth. This is God's planet. This is part of his kingdom. So for us to try to take over and say, well, I think this should be happening. I think there should be less trees here and more trees here or whatever the case may be is us taking charge of something that God has preordained for himself. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them. He chose their seed after them, even you above all people as it is this day. So uh, then he goes on to talk about other stuff with, to do with God being the one in charge. He's the one who really makes all these decisions. If we're following after him, if we're listening to him, then we'll be doing the part of his plan that we need to be doing. All right, let's go back to, uh, we'll do a little bit more here. I'm only gonna go halfway through the video for today because uh, we are stopping and taking the time to go through a lot of verses. So we'll, we'll break this up into a two-part video, uh, but we'll, we got a couple more, couple more sections here we'll talk about. And uh, she's just about to talk more about this idea of Mother Earth. The Earth today. She only invited 1.5 billion people to the party, but 7 billion showed up. In fact, as I'm writing this, about another 150 people have been born. So this is something, this, this word or this term, Mother Earth, shows up a lot when you're talking to anyone who is a tree hugger or who is uh, concerned about taking care of the Earth. And... It's, it's very telling that that is the phrasing and that is the concept that is used because it shows that this Mother Earth or Gaia, as you may have heard it mentioned, is a false god. It is, it is replacing the idea of who is really in charge and who we really answer to instead of it being God Almighty Jehovah, the creator of the universe, it's the earth itself. And there's very specific scripture about some of these things. Uh, let's first off go into Psalm 104. Psalm 104 and verse number 24. Psalm 104. Verse 24, it says, O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So her concern here in this in this video, she's talking about how uh, Mother Earth does not have, didn't have enough food for the party, right? Didn't invite this many people. But 
Mother Earth's not the one in charge of this party at all. God's the one in charge. And it says here, in wisdom hast thou made them all. God made all of the things he made, knowing full well their beginning, middle, and end, how much they would, how they would bring forth, how many people would be born throughout all of time. He knew all of that before he even started the process of making everything. So when we get concerned or we say, well, there's not going to be enough or I uh, should have done things this way. Again, we're encroaching on God's dominion. We're also accusing God of not having full wisdom and not having full ownership. The earth is full of thy riches. I think that phrasing is really interesting because it, sh it shows how the earth has so much bounty within it that we have not even touched upon yet. Uh, I, I've heard it mentioned, you know, when people talk about drinking water and, and having a clean water problem, we have plenty of water. The earth is full of water. The, you look at a, at a map of the earth and most of it is water. It's the big blue ball, right? The big blue marble. Our problem is not a water problem. Our problem is a salt problem, right? Because all of that water is salt water and we, we would need to find a way to, to pull the salt out so that we could actually drink that water and it would and it would be good. But there's plenty of material. There's plenty of resources on the earth. Uh, the biggest problem, of course, that we face is to do a distribution or, you know, some people hoarding more or others. And, and we'll talk maybe a little more about that in a moment. But the idea that there's not enough resources, that the earth is going to run out and there's not going to be enough stuff to go around and, we're, and people are just going to starve. While that does happen in places where they don't get access to the resources, the resources do exist. The earth is full of riches, as, as the Bible says here. Uh, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, Deuteronomy chapter 32, and verses 3 and 4. He says, because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. That's what we should be doing when we're talking about any large scale issues is ascribing greatness unto God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. So we cannot dare to accuse him of saying, oh, look, you made this planet and you told us to multiply, but you didn't make enough resources for us all to be able to multiply. That is not our place. And it is completely and patently false, according to the scripture. Uh, let's go to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. He says here, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So he says here that if you are fainting, if you are struggling, if you are in trouble, your answers aren't going to come from resource management within the earth. Your answers aren't going to come from how can we help Mother Earth uh, regrow and be reborn born and cut back on the population. Your answers are going to come only and totally from God himself. And that's who you should be turning to if you're struggling, if you're having issues, if you don't have enough to eat, if you are looking for answers to life's problems, those answers are all found in God himself. All right, we'll got one more section we'll do here and then we'll cut it off for this episode. Shocking, isn't it? An average of 150 people are born every one minute. This means every day approximately 489,600 people are born. All right, so she's talking about how many people are born and just kind of reiterating this point. Uh, let's go back and let's look at some more verses about how this is actually a good thing for people to be born. Deuteronomy chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 2, sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 7, Deuteronomy chapter 7, starting verse 12. He says, Wherefore it shall come to pass, if ye hearken to these judgments, and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swear unto thy fathers. So he's, he's giving, he's talking about this as a promise to Israel, but we see how God operates within these verses. And he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. We see again, this idea of multiplication of humankind is an indicator of blessing by the Lord. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn, thy wine, thine oil, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep in the land which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee. So here we see again that God's blessing and multiplication go hand in hand. Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your cattle. So the idea of being barren, of not being able to bring forth fruit is a sign of God's displeasure or that he has not blessed you. All right, let's go to Psalm 113. Psalm 113. And we we'll, we just read this whole psalm, really. Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifted the needy out of the dunghill 
that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. And there we see again, if you are struggling, if you are, if you are barren, if you are, as it says there, the poor or the needy, where do you turn for help? Where do you turn for solutions? It's not the government. It's not uh, someone who is offering a loan to you. It is not in solving the world's problems that you will receive uh, help with your own problems. It is when you turn to God and you ask him for help and you ask him to be the one to provide for you that you will see those blessings come. One more verse uh, or set of verses we'll go into here. Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. And here again, uh, we see God's promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And there we see again that God's blessing and God's multiplication that he gives to us go hand in hand. If you are able to multiply, that is a sign that God is pleased with what you're doing, which is multiplying. If God stops up that process, then that's a sign that you need to turn to God and ask him, you know, what? Are, how should we proceed? What are we supposed to be doing? Uh, I don't want to, of course, make a blanket statement uh, because this is, of course, one of the one of the biggest things people do when they come, especially non-Christians, when they come to the scripture and they're like, well, how does God let bad things happen? For example, we cannot have children. Does that mean God hates us? And I don't believe that it to be the case. I don't see that as a specific uh, indication within the scripture where he says, well, because you can't have children, I hate you. That's what that means. However, like any problem, as we looked at throughout all the verses we've looked at, like any issue, any any goal that we're trying to get to that God has stopped the way of, we need to take a moment and look to him and say, God, what are you trying to teach me? What are you, where are you trying to take me? What are you trying to accomplish in me through your working in my life, your intervening in my life? And look to that, look to him for the answers. We can't just say, well, because of this and because how God worked in someone else's life, well, that's, you know, we need to look directly to God, ask the Holy Spirit for guidance, look to the scripture and look for these things. Uh, the, really, the main thing I wanted to focus on in this first half was getting through those concepts of, hey, it's our responsibility to take care of the earth. That is that is in the scripture. Uh, if we're trashing the earth, if we're, if we're you know, burning things down without rebuilding, that kind of a thing, destroying, then that is obviously not of God. That's not the way to run things. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to touch on, and, and really we've talked about it a lot, is that having children is a good thing. Having lots of children is a, is a lot of a good thing. Children are responsibility, children are work, but they are also a gift from the Lord. As we saw, that idea of arrows in your quiver is a very, very good illustration of that, a very good way to describe that. And so uh, that's really what I wanted to leave off with that, with this episode today. This is episode, I guess, number two for 2021 of Bible Versus with Morphite. And uh, my name's Sam, and we'll come back next time with episode number three. We'll go to part two of Bible Versus Bindi Irwin. I really just named it that way because it rolls off the tongue so easily, but really this encompasses a lot of concepts uh, to do with the green earth, ecology, all of that stuff, the Green New Deal, all of those things. So we'll get in a little more into more of that next next week. Thank you so much for joining us. If you want to see more of these videos, subscribe, uh, share the video, please, with someone else if you think they would like this material, if they or if you're there looking for verses about this kind of stuff. That's really the point of this series is to uh, get those Bible verses out there so we know how to discuss these issues in the world today from a scriptural perspective. Thank you so much.